Good morning, everybody. I'm Josh, and this is my beautiful wife, Alyssa. So we're all watching church from home this week. And can you believe it? Exactly one year ago today was the first day that our church services went exclusively online, thanks to you know what. Uh, at the time, we thought it would maybe be a few weeks or months, but it's definitely gone on longer than anyone could have anticipated. And we are so thankful that we started to meet in person again. Uh, it was so good to see so many of your smiling faces last week. Well, we assume you were smiling. It's kind of hard to tell wearing masks. Uh, but we look forward to meeting in person again at Girls Inc. next week and every two weeks moving forward. But don't worry, we're still going to have our live stream services every week online. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And happy almost spring, everyone. March is never the most beautiful time of the year with mm -hmm. the dirty snow remains and the ground covered in a mix of slush and mud. My birthday's in March, and as a kid, I always wished I'd been born in a different month, especially the summer. One year, I actually did have a summer birthday party, and I celebrated my birthday five months late so I could have a sleepover on our trampoline. Wasn't the best sleep of my life, but it was fun. I feel like you could have anticipated that not going well, but you were young. My back hurts just thinking about it. Uh, anyway, since March doesn't usually give us the best weather here in New Hampshire, one thing that we love to do is play board games. Mm -hmm. So tell us some of your favorite games in the comments and some of your least favorite. How about you, Alyssa? My favorite game is probably Ticket to Ride, and mm -hmm. my least favorite mm -hmm. is Pandemic. Wah, wah. Too soon, honey. Too soon. <laughs> but really, I never liked that game, even before COVID. How about you, Josh? That is a hard one. It's like choosing between children. I have quite an affinity for board games. Some might call me uh, me an obsessor, but uh, haters gonna hate. Uh, it's one of, one of my favorites is Dominion. It's a little nerdy, but so am I, so it works. Unfortunately, some people's wives don't quite enjoy the nerd factor. Uh, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. Least favorite game, I'm probably gonna get destroyed here, but it would have to be Monopoly. I honestly don't think I've ever legitimately finished a game of Monopoly in my entire life. How did they even pitch that idea? Hey, you know how everybody loves taxes, mortgages, and the stressful process of home buying? <laughs> Let's turn that into a three-hour board game. But wait, in case you're not sold yet, you can be a thimble. <laughs> that said, uh, I know many dearly love it, so have at it, more power to you. Enjoy. Nice attempt to dig yourself out of that one, yeah. Josh. Join the conversation. I hope you're all sharing the games you love and the ones you do not in the comments. Yeah, all right. Well, enough of that intro fluff. Now for what we're really here for. <laughs> if this is your first time joining with us today, The Well is a church in New Hampshire, uh, in Nashua, that cares deeply about our city and about helping our friends and neighbors know and follow Jesus. Now, no matter where you are on your journey of faith, uh, we want you to know that you belong here with us and that you matter tremendously to God. Wherever you're watching from this morning, we want to encourage you all to engage with us. Mm -hmm. Like this video, share it with your friends, like our Facebook page, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And feel free to comment in the chat and engage with the message through our message notes. And as always, whether you're new or already a part of our church family, we encourage you to fill out a digital connection card or a DCC. Uh, you can access the digital connection card through the link in today's description. Uh, these cards are tailored to each message and they include a specific next step you can take. So fill out one this morning. I triple dog dare you. Wow, you went right to triple dog there. I'm pretty serious about this. <laughs> so before we jump into our message today, just a few announcements. We are three weeks away from Easter Sunday. Mm. We will be having an in-person service that morning and of course online as well as mm -hmm. usual. It's a great opportunity, though, for our in-person service to invite friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. Instead of our annual egg hunt this year, we're giving away Easter baskets to local families on mm -hmm. March 27th. So be on the lookout for a registration form if you're interested in getting a basket for your family. Yeah, that's really exciting. Also, we want to announce that we are launching a new app called Church Center. Now, from that app, you can watch live stream services, give, connect to groups, and check in for in-person services. You can find Church Center on the App Store and on Google Play. Awesome. That's great. Well, let's pray before we hear from Pastor Scott. Thank you, God, for this morning. Um, we just, we come to you and we're, we're ready to learn. We're ready to just hear from you. Um, and we pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds um, as we listen to Pastor Scott. I pray that we would um, take something from the message today that we can really apply to our lives. Um, and I thank you so much for your love for us and your faithfulness always. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm.
Hey everybody, so glad you're with us today. My name is Scott Kearney, I'm the lead pastor here at The Well, and we're gonna continue in our series, Trustworthy, that we started last week. We're asking the central question, who can you trust? I mean, we're, we're in a, an age where it's difficult to trust, right? Difficult to trust our leaders, our institution, news sources, and man, we've been divided you know, more than ever. I think this dis distrust really runs pretty deep. Uh, and in the pandemic, it kind of brought a lot of all of that out, right? Uh, from politicians to policies, to news sources, to social movements, you know, it, it, is, it is hard to trust what we're seeing, right? Because we're just on this side. We don't know exactly what's happening. And man, when you get quarantined, that gets worse right? Uh, so I think one of the greatest areas of divides in all of this is what's true, right? You know, we, we look at news sources and what they're painting, but we're asking, man, is that true? Like, or is that biased information? You know, what is true? Now, skepticism about even truth in general and whether we can even know truth uh, has been going on for a while. I think, you know, uh, a lot of colleges and universities, they just anticipate their students are coming in with this kind of core value all truth is relative, right? Kind of depends on your point of view. So you determine what's right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not gonna infringe my beliefs on you. That, that's kind of, it's, it's a big, it has been a big movement, but then enter 2020 and suddenly truth matters now, right? Some people are like, no, 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 there's a clear right. There is a clear wrong when it comes to racial reconciliation, when it comes to political divides, when it comes to, you know, opening or not opening. I mean, suddenly truth mattered now and it wasn't just relative. There was a clear right, there was a clear wrong. And so we're kind of swinging back a little bit. The only question really is, what is it? What is right? What's right? We, we're, we're divided over what that actually is. We know truth matters, right? We felt that, but how do you know it? What do you trust? How can you trust? Now, skepticism towards organized religion. We're a church, right? We know that this has been growing, especially in the Northeast for quite some time. Uh, skepticism about institutional church. Uh, can you trust them? Can you not? Uh, and even over just their sources of truth. So evangelicals, we believe the Bible is the word of God for a long time, right? Uh, and but there's been growing skepticism about the Bible. You know, is it trustworthy? Was it put together the right way? You know, can, can we actually trust that these are reliable documents, that what I'm reading is not just totally biased information put together by politically motivated people? Anyway, that's a bigger question for a different time. If you have questions on that, actually we have a whole message on that. But this skepticism, right? Uh, there's the research organizations that have actually understood that this area between Manchester, uh, New Hampshire and Boston is the second least biblically minded area of the country. More people distrusting this than just about anywhere in the country. I think the only other one was uh, Albany, New York. Anyway, skepticism is high. Now here's what's at stake in this. When we ask the question, who do we trust? How can we trust? What sources are really trustworthy? Here's what's at stake. If we continue to divide on what we trust, we're gonna get more and more polarized and the division in our country is gonna run deeper. The division in our churches is gonna run deeper. And so we have to really ask the question, what is true and how do we find it? How do we get back to that place? What is really trustworthy as far as news, okay? All right, that's where we're going today. Well, Paul is gonna be leading us as we continue through the book of 1 Corinthians, his ancient letter to this group of early Christians that were meeting in house churches all throughout uh, that Mediterranean area of Corinth. Uh, and he's leading them at this point back to unity. Last week, we talked a lot about the division that they were experiencing. Some saying, I follow this guy, I follow that guy. There's a lot of division there. Well, he's saying, hey, let me get, bring you back to actually what's true, okay? Because when you unite on truth, you're gonna unite at all sorts of different levels, okay? Now, now here's, uh, here's, here's what I'm gonna challenge you with today. If you consider yourself a Christian, here's what I'm gonna challenge you in. I wanna challenge you uh, to think if, if you believe the Bible or if you have a set of truths that you believe uh, based on your faith in Jesus, are you actually living more united, okay? Are you working towards unity inside the church and out based on that truth or are you contributing to the disunity in our world? And then if you're not a believer, here's what I'm gonna challenge you to do today. I want you to challenge your own assumptions. Both of us need to challenge our assumptions, but I want you to challenge your assumptions and doubt your doubts today, okay? Here's where we're gonna go. We're gonna look at the limits of our reasoning capacity, okay? So here's, here's what Paul's going to challenge us right off the bat. First thing I want you guys to write down, and it's this. Stop overthinking and doubt your doubts. Stop overthinking and doubt your doubts. There's a limit to our reasoning capacity. So here's where Paul's gonna take us. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 18. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness, 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. This is like Paul quoting God. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. So Paul asks, where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? All the really elite, intelligent people, you know, academia, where are they? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in, um, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he concludes it this way. He says, for the foolishness of God, it's wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Paul says there is a central message to Christianity and he uses the word, uh, you know, the message of the cross. The cross really is the center point of all of human history and the central point of Christianity for those who believe in Jesus. Now, what's so interesting about this is the word that he chooses for message. When he says the message of the cross is foolish, the word message in the original Greek is the word logos. And logos was a loaded term back in the first century, particularly with those uh, with the Greek philosophical background. You see, a lot of uh, the Greeks, they prized uh, intelligence, they prized academia, philosophy, and logos was a loaded term that didn't just mean message, it meant the reason for life. <laughs> the central idea around which you would organize your entire life. This is what philosophers would debate about back and forth. What is that central piece of information, that central philosophical idea around which everything else revolves around? That's logos. And what Paul is saying here is that that central piece that we organize everything around is the cross. It's the cross. Now, this didn't make any sense, okay? Um, I, like, it didn't make any sense for people in the first century. Now, like, we prize intellect, too. We prize our academia. We prize our reasoning. You know, we, we look all over the place for, uh, you know, great tidbits on how to improve our life, self-help stuff. We go to YouTube for DIY stuff all the time. We go to higher academia, right? You got to go to elementary school, grade school, high school, college, you know, grad school, and then get your doctor. Like, we, we, we prize intelligence in our age. But what Paul is saying is that the central thing around which we organize everything is for foolishness to higher academia, okay? Here, here's what he means by this, okay? Jews were looking for signs. It says that the cross was stumbling blocks for Jews because they were looking for signs. Well, what kind of signs? Well, the Jews, they were looking for a political Messiah, someone who was going to overthrow Rome and help restore the land back to the people of Israel. They weren't looking for someone to die on a cross, much less a Messiah dying on the cross. They were looking for a Moses, like a second Moses to come in and kind of do all those signs that he did to Pharaoh, you know, to get those plagues going on Egypt and, and basically bring the Israelites out of slavery to the promised land. That's what they were looking for. They wanted the Israelites, the Jews, to get brought out of the slavery, the captivity that the Romans had them under so they could have their own land back, they could have their power back. That's what they were expecting. And so to have a, a Jewish Messiah come in and not just die on a cross, but to claim to be God and die on the cross, I mean, utter nonsense. I mean, to make matters worse, in their law, in Deuteronomy 21, 23, it said that anybody who was hung on a tree had the curse of God on them. Sheer nonsense. Why would the Messiah die on a cross? That made no sense to them. Now, the Greeks, they were looking for wisdom. Again, they had this philosophical system that they just prized over everything. And, and you know, there were traveling speakers who would actually come into Corinth spreading their wisdom, their knowledge. They were trying to gain all sorts of crowds. And whoever had the best philosophy, the best oratory, you know, the, the better ideas, that was the person who's won. Now, again, if, if you're prizing that and you look at someone who's like, pinned on a cross who didn't even defend himself verbally in front of Pilate and the people who are accusing him, they're like, well, that's just utter nonsense. And so it made no sense. It was foolishness, absolute foolishness to those. Now, some of you understand this, right? In post-Christian culture here in America, uh, they don't exactly prize Christianity. <laughs> the cross might be still one of the most popular symbols, popular icons in all of human history, from necklaces to pendants to chains to, you know, on, on old buildings and all that. People tattoo it on themselves. And yet, 
Christianity, it's not exactly looked at in the best light in our media, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they continue to be kind of portrayed as the naive, stupid, backwoods, maybe Tennesseans that are going up against the high intellectuals at Harvard, right? <laughs> it's like, if you're a Christian, you have got to where you got, not based on evidence and reason, but more blind faith, right? That's how they're painted. And, uh, you know, some, some naturalists and, and popular atheists, they've, they've put it this way. Richard Dawkins put it this way. He says, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. You see this, this treasure of intellect, okay? Sam Harris, he says, atheism is not a philosophy nor even a view of the world. It's simply an admission of the obvious. Some of you, man, maybe you felt this. You started trusting Jesus. You started going down this road a little bit, but some people looking around you, you're like, really? You're going to believe that? I mean, that's for the naive people who need a crutch. Like maybe some of your family members have rejected you, thought you were stupid for believing the Bible was true or starting to trust Jesus, maybe even getting baptized. Why in the world would you do that? Well, let me, let me just say, the world is going to think we're foolish at times. Paul put it this way in a, in his, in a, in a different letter to the Corinthians. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 2.15, he says, For we are to God the, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved uh, and, and those who are perishing. In fact, like he, he was saying, we kind of we stink to those who are perishing. Okay, like We, we smell good to those <laughs> who are of God. We stink with, with those who don't. You can read the rest of that passage to get more of that. But Jesus put it this way in Matthew 10.22. He says, You'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Some of you feel this. Now, in this passage, Paul says, yeah, it's going to appear foolish to a bunch of people in this world, but God's going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. What do you mean by that? How, how does God destroy the wisdom of the wise? Here's how he does it. Here's what I want to I postulate to you. And maybe for some of you watching this, like you're thinking, yeah, I I've, I've thought Christianity was naive and really kind of the secular humanist ideas, the goodness of humanity. Like that's what we should buy into because that's based more on logic and reason and science, right? Well, here's what I want to throw at you. We all have faith. We all have faith. No matter what your worldview is, you didn't arrive at it purely by reason. You've got faith. And let me just throw it out this way, okay? Even if you consider yourself an agnostic or an atheist, you've arrived at some of your conclusions based on faith alone. Watch this. Richard Lewinton, who is an evolutionary biologist, uh, he wrote in a New York book review at one point, a really telling and honest admission of how he arrived at what he arrived at, at an evolutionary naturalistic standpoint. He admitted this to his colleagues, ready? He says, I have a prior commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You see that? He's saying, yeah, we've, we've been able to study these things, but our science alone actually doesn't prove or disprove the existence of God. We actually, we have arrived at this because I have a prior commitment. I'm not going to allow God into the picture. I'm not even going to consider that, okay? Stephen Jay Gould, who is an atheist and one of the leading evolutionary biologists and paleontologists of the past 100 years, brilliant guy. This is what he admits to his colleagues. He says, nature just is in all her complexity and diversity and all her sublime indifference to our desires. Therefore, we cannot use nature for our moral instruction or for answering any question about uh, the magisterium of religion. To say it to my colleagues for the umpteenth million time, science simply cannot by its legitimate methods adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply cannot comment on it as scientists. In other words, what he's saying is we, we violate a categorical uh, uh, field of study when we try to say based on science, God doesn't exist. He's like, we can't even comment on that. Like, science can't tell us exactly why we think things are beautiful. Science can't tell us exactly why unconditional love is something we gravitate towards. It also can't comment on the fact that God could exist or doesn't exist. He's like, it's a categorical violation of a field of study. We cannot comment on it. Now, to put it in, in, in perspective on this too, uh, one of the, the blind faith leaps that a lot of naturalists you know, people who believe in a closed system without God in the world, one of the leaps that they take is on the Big Bang. How did it get here? How did we get here? Like, you know, let alone the fact that we could think and feel and, and postulate and, and philosophize all, about all sorts of things, that we have that kind of mind and soul. Like, 
how did we even get here? <laughs> Some people will go back to the Big Bang and they're like, well, the Big Bang happened. Well, how'd the Big Bang happen? How can everything come from nothing? I mean, where did all of this start in the first place, okay? So Einstein actually looked at Edwin Hubble's exploration of the universe and everything expanding from one small place to boom, ex expanding at a much rapid place from one spot. And he actually said, this, this is what he said. He said, to think that a creator, someone, an intelligent being was behind all this, he says, this is the most beautiful, satisfactory explanation of creation to which I have ever listened to. So the question really is, what takes more faith? To believe that all of this and everything that we see in the world that we love about this world came by blind, chaotic forces or came about because of an intelligent creator who wrote his image in you to care about certain things, to love people, and to see right and wrong. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Paul is saying there's a limit to our rationality. To try to understanding all of this just based on our own intellect, we need something beyond ourselves to understand all of this. And so Paul's challenging us. <laughs> How much faith does it take? So he says, stop overthinking. Stop overthinking and doubt your doubts. The universe makes more sense with God in the center of it. You know, why do, we, why do we long for meaning? Why do we long for purpose? Why do we long for satisfaction beyond just the daily grind? It makes more sense with God. And so, like, here, here's how, like, sometimes we can trip ourselves up with overthinking, right? Like, you overthink relationships. If you overthink relationships, you're never going to have relationships, right? I know some people that, like, I mean, they almost use the, the Seinfeld approach, right? When you think about getting involved in a, a serious relationship, <laughs> it's like, let's just create a list of all the things that are wrong about that person, right? She's got man hands, right? Like, I mean, all sorts of things. Like, we can overthink relationships. And I'm telling you, if Charity and I overthought our relationship back when we were 19 and 20, 21, 22, like, just getting to know each other there, we never would have gotten married, right? She would have seen way too many things about me that just was too risky to get involved in. But at some point, what did we do? I mean, we took a little bit of a leap, Right? We got into the relationship, not because we understood all of it, but because she was worth it. <laughs> I saw enough in her to say, you know what? I got to take a next step with her. There's something amazing about this woman. I want, I want to do life with her. Guys, we can get to analysis paralysis in here. And Paul is saying, stop, stop overthinking. There is a limit to rationality here. And you know what people are, are going to think is foolish. Sometimes it's the wisdom and the power of God. When we lean into the cross, the cross is going to look foolish to so many people, but stop overthinking and doubt your doubts. You can get to analysis paralysis. I actually had a conversation with someone earlier this week. We're sitting down and they were just, they were saying, you know, I was at your church for a little bit, but you know, I mean, just the way that some people were looking at me or maybe talking to me, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to go back. There's, there's a possibility. I'm like, well, did you ask them? You know, like you might, you might have felt like they didn't care about you, but you know, have you actually talked to them? Well, no. There's so many things that we can overthink. You can overthink, but it can lead to paralysis. Okay. Stop overthinking. Now here's how fragile a, a materialistic world is uh, when you just leave it to just a materialistic world as opposed to God, okay? That's how fragile it is. Naturalism assumes that we do what we do because we've survived, okay? Natural, you know, selection, the survival of the fittest. Uh, we believe that, like, we've gotten to the, the advanced stages that we have only based on survival of the fittest. And so a lot of atheists say, look, we got to evolve past religion. Religion may have been useful at one point uh, for a crutch or for people to feel better about themselves, but we got to evolve past that. However, C.S. Lewis was once an atheist. He was once an, once an atheist, but as he started looking more into Christianity, and particularly the cross, the more he found it not only beautiful, but it made more sense than anything else. And here's how he put it, okay? He said, we have to look to a reasoning capacity beyond our own minds. He said, if certainty, in other words, truth, is merely a feeling in our own minds, kind of chemical reactions, right? You know, the product of evolution just forming us. If it was just chemical reactions, a feeling in our own minds, and not genuine insight into realities beyond them, then we can have no knowledge. Unless, uh, unless human reasoning is valid, no science 
can be true. And, and he kind of continued this, this this way. He said, strict naturalism by itself refutes itself. And he quoted an old professor of his uh, saying, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. <laughs> and hence, I have no reason to suppose that my brain is composed of atoms. Try that one on, right? Kind of like you put yourself in an intellectual noose in that point. <laughs> but anyway, look, we've got to doubt our doubts. Even Charles Darwin himself, he was like, if I think a little bit about you know natural selection just getting me to the place that I, that I am, I don't know if I can even trust my own mind and my reasoning. This is what he said, Charles Darwin, right? He says, within me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind which have been developed from the mind of lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. Who do you trust? What can you trust? Can you trust even your own mind if God is not in the picture? The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing because sometimes we prize our own intellect to our own detriment. You got to be open to something beyond you speaking into your life and doing things that you didn't expect. That's why Paul is saying God says he's going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the intelligent of the intelligent, he said, I'm going to frustrate. There is a limit to human reasoning. And so he says, man, where is the wise person? Sometimes we think we know what we need because we just prize our own intellect. We think we know what we need. <laughs> so lunch the other day, I was sitting down with my kids and uh, Charity had gotten some uh, Cape Cod chips. Anybody else a big fan of Cape Cod chips, like barbecue, white cheddar, so good. She brought them home for lunch uh, and uh, she had made the sandwiches and the, uh, the veggies, put them on the kid's plate. And halfway through the lunch, she brings in the Cape Cod chips. And I'm telling you, at that point, all the health eating was over. All the kids wanted was the chips, you know? All they wanted was the chips. And it, it, at that point, it became a battle. Mommy, how much do I have to eat to get to the chips? I'm so done with my sandwich. I'm so done with my veggies. And we're just like, just stop. Just, just eat your food. Some of them refused to eat the rest of their lunch and started weeping because they were like, chips! Look, sometimes we think we know what we need but it's actually not what you really need, okay? Like some of you think you can get all your wisdom based on a couple of podcasts and a couple of self-help books or DIY on YouTube. You gotta be open to some things that the world is calling foolish. You need to come back to God, who alone has the answers of the universe. Look, we're just not as smart as we think we are. You know, like 500 years ago, we thought that the sun revolved around the earth. <laughs> I mean, it, and there was, a, there was a time where we thought the earth was flat. I mean, no joke. There was a conspiracy that was going around on YouTube a couple of years ago that was saying the world was flat and tons of people were buying into it. You are not as smart as you think you are. We're not as smart as we think we are. There's a limit, okay? Secular humanists, they prize intellect, they prize technology, but with the same technology that we were so smart to come up with, we dropped an atomic bomb on several unsuspecting cities. I mean, millions of people. With the same technology, we have enslaved so many people to virtual realities. And we've actually put, I mean, millions of young men behind a screen, wasting their life on video games for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Did you know that our intellect sometimes can be our own worst enemy? So here's what I wanna challenge you to do, okay? I want you to ask some questions at this point. Maybe you're listening at this point, like it, pull out the DCC, our digital connection card, and I want you to give some information about who you are. I want you to ask the hardest questions. Ask us. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna respond to those in the upcoming weeks, okay? Maybe some of you listening to this, you're like, I don't know if I could trust God. I mean, I've got so many questions about the universe, about reality. You know, I, I just, I wanna ask some questions. I challenge you, don't wait. Ask them right now. Ask them right now. Well, What's at the core of this, okay? If we can't trust our, in our own intellect and our own technology, what's at the core of this? How do we figure out, like, what's at the is the real root of the issue? Well, here's what the Bible says. The real core of the issue is sin. And you gotta address that. It's a heart level. There's no technology or in information that's gonna change the whole world and get us all on the same page. We've gotta dig at the heart, the real root of the issue, which is sin. It's a selfishness, an utter selfishness that separated us from God and put the whole universe out of whack, okay? So here's, here's what I wanna challenge you to do. The second thing I want you to write down. We're, we're gonna challenge you, rebuild trust and unity. Rebuild trust and unity in our community by embracing the beauty of the cross 
the beauty of the cross because the cross comes in to solve a problem for you that you and I desperately needed. And it wasn't to fix us at an information level and it wasn't to fix our circumstances like the Jews wanted, the signs and miracles. No, it was to fix something on the inside of us at the core of who we are that was at the root of all of the issues around us, okay? Again, we didn't need self-help to fix ourselves. We need something else. We didn't need our intelligence. We needed something even bigger than that. Let me take you on a journey on this, okay, for a second. I was reading about this story of a guy named Landon Gilkey. Landon Gilkey was born in 1919, and uh, he was born to a really intelligent family. His, his mom and dad, they were professors, uh, and he went on to uh, graduate school at Harvard, uh, graduated with honors and a philosophy degree. And though he'd kind of grown up around some Christian circles, he had long abandoned that and, and thought, you know, it's secular humanism that we need. This is what's going to solve the problems in the world. We just need better intelligence, better technology. We could fix anything with goodwill, good people. Like this is, this is what we need. Now he got a job in China uh, and he was teaching philosophy. And back in 1939, this is when the Japanese army in World War II actually started infiltrating China, and he found himself in just a short while in a concentration camp with 2,000 people in a small compound. And in it, it was a fascinating case study that he was observing at this time. And he's thinking, okay, we're all in over our heads. We're in a tough spot. This is where I think secular humanism is going to come to the rescue. <laughs> you know, we just need to come together. We need to be uh, ingenuitive. Like we, we need to trust each other and we just need to be good. And at first he was like, man, this is it. We don't need religion. This is it because like they, they kind of worked together a little bit to kind of improve some of their conditions. But as the conditions got worse, he got super disillusioned about secular humanism because bit by bit by bit, he found everybody getting more and more selfish. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the people who didn't believe in God. It was, it was religious people that were getting really selfish and justifying, stealing, lying, trying to get ahead, you know, any way they possibly could. And I'm telling you, when you rely on either just living however you want to live and your own intelligence, or you rely religiously on just being as good as you possibly can be, you're going to be selfish, you're going to be self-reliant, and you're going to be self-righteous. And he saw that in this concentration camp, and he's like, man, where do we turn to? Well, there was one guy that changed everything for him in that concentration camp, and his name was Eric Little. Eric Little was a Scottish Presbyterian missionary who is most famous for his running in the Olympics when he actually uh, chose not to run in his best meter, uh, in his best event because uh, it was running on Sunday and he wanted to honor God uh, and he had to run in a different one. But he was most known for that, but he was actually a Scottish missionary to China and he was in the same camp as this guy, Landon Gilkey. Gilkey. And in it, he noticed that Eric lived like no one else did. He was selfless time and time again. He continued to love people around him. He served everywhere that he went. He sacrificed his things so that other people could go. And in fact, the British government actually tried to release him from that concentration camp. And they actually got approval from the Japanese government to release Eric. But you know what he did? He rejected it and gave it to a pregnant woman, letting her go free. And Eric actually died in that concentration camp. Langdon looked at this guy and he said, there's something different about him. He's basing his life, he's organizing his entire life about something so much different. It's not the intelligence of this world that so many people treasure and it's not the self-righteousness of religion. No, it's something based entirely on something else. And what was it? It was the cross. It was the grace of Jesus Christ. Exactly what Paul is talking about here. The power and the wisdom of God. What is it? Here's the reality. Eric was living out of this reality of what God had done for him. And here's, here's one of the things I want you to know. You can write this down. We don't need good advice. We don't need good advice. We need good news of something that was done for us. We need good news. Here's how that works, okay? Sin in the Bible says that we were so far gone, we were so lost that we could not save ourselves. We were so selfish that all the, all the stupid things that we'd done had separated us from God for all eternity. We could not save ourselves. We were so hopelessly gone. But God in his infinite love did not want that to be the ongoing reality. And so he wrote himself into the story, his perfect son. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and do for us what we could not do, to rescue us. He didn't come to teach us good advice so that we could pick ourselves up, three steps to get a better life, you know, five steps to restore your marriage. No, Jesus didn't do that. He came to rescue us, to actually extend the power of God through unconditional love. And only when, we did, when, when he did that, could he pave this way back to 
God. And so what we need is not intelligence. We don't just need ingenuity. We don't just need to change our circumstances. No, we need a rescuer who came to heal us at the heart level. And when Eric Little understood this, that he was worse than he thought he was, so bad that God had to die for him, and yet so loved that God willingly died for him on the cross, it changed his whole life. It was the wisdom and the power of God. And it translated into humility, where he didn't see himself better than other people. And it translated to power, a lifestyle of sacrifice, true sacrifice. Not sacrifice so that I could get better and improve the circumstances for me. No, a sacrifice that was literally, I'm laying it all on the line, all like sacrifice completely myself for the benefit of other people. This is why the cross changes all of human history. It's not good advice, it's good news. And when you base your life on that, and only that, can we actually experience unity. At the foot of the cross, we all are helpless. And so there's no perfect people and none of us can measure ourselves better than anyone else. This is the news that we need, but at the, at the foot of the cross, we are also more loved than we ever dared hope because God willingly died for you and me. Maybe some of you don't know this. I wanna challenge you in this moment to give your life to Jesus and to trust him for the first time. I'm gonna pray for us in this moment right now and I, I want you, I want you to lean in. And for some of you, again, if you're believers, I want you to challenge your assumptions and say, man, do I really internalize this enough to actually work towards unity, to contribute to this world in a sacrificial way, not for my benefit, but for the benefit of the world because God gave it all for me. And if you don't believe, I want you to see this as your opportunity right now to get right with Jesus and embrace this gift. So would you pray with me? Jesus, we wanna lean into you in this moment. God, we recognize that we don't have it all together. We don't know all the answers. We're not perfect. We have blown it. And we just confess that right now, God, that we are not enough. And so we come to you. And God, we may have thought Christianity and the cross was foolishness before, but right now we wanna embrace you that the cross is the center point of all of human history. And it's, it's where we received your precious gift of forgiveness, of reconciliation with you. We receive that, God, and we wanna say thank you. God, and we wanna trust our lives to you because we believe, God, that you alone are trustworthy. Google didn't die for us. Our political platforms would not die for us. But the God of this universe who made us came in and died for us in our place. And so we trust you. We trust you. We surrender our life to you. You are trustworthy. Help us to build our lives on you and empower us to make this world a better place because of Jesus and his good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, I'm so glad that you joined us today. Look, if you took that next step with us uh, of trusting Jesus, we want you to indicate that on your connection card. Maybe for some of you, you want to express this. You want to contribute in this world. Go ahead and sign up for our serve team and, and be a part of us remaking this world on Sunday mornings and way beyond during the week so that we can extend the love of Jesus, this power, this unconditional love everywhere we go. I'm going to hand it back over to our hosts. We're going to close this out. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, what does it look like to be the people of God under this? That God has actually chosen the weak of the world to shame the wise. So we love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you then. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for that awesome message. Unity is so important and so hard to find in our world today. I'm so thankful that we have a common purpose and a common mission as a church. Let's respond to the unity Christ has given us through the cross by joining in his mission with those around us and serving those in our community. I also want to invite you to join us in giving generously as so many of you already do. Your generosity really makes a difference and plays a part in transforming people's lives in the name of Jesus. You can give online at thewellnh.org slash give, where you can give a one-time gift or automate your giving. And you can also give via text by texting the dollar sign and amount to 84321. And lastly, before we go, we want to remind you to not hesitate to connect with us for any support you may be needing, whether that's emotional or spiritual or just in regards to the challenges of daily life. And Jesus has been so generous to us and we want to serve our neighbors in his name with his love. He's the one who reunited us to God through his sacrifice and resurrection and he offers living, lasting, never failing hope to you no matter where you are 
what you've done or what you've been through. You can never wander so far that he won't welcome you back with open arms. Hey, we hope you'll join us next week at Girls Inc. or online. Have a great rest of your Sunday, everyone. Bye. Bye.